Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for listening to my talk. My name is Martha Augustinos, and I'm from the School of Psychology, the University of Adelaide, South Australia. It's very wet and cold down here in the Southern Hemisphere. I only wish that uh, I could be uh, in Hong Kong, the beautiful city of Hong Kong, but unfortunately, um, international events being the way they are over the last few years, that hasn't made it possible. I'm hoping that will change um, soon and we can um, start to see uh, our friends again. I'd like to thank the organisers of uh, ICLASP for their very kind invitation to present uh, at this year's conference and in particular Bernadette Watson who, um, who has helped me through all the changes and the logistics uh, of the conference. Uh, uh, over the last couple of years, I suppose now it's been. So what I wanna talk about today is the discursive turn in psychology and uh, pose the question, what have we learned? Um, because it has been um, over 30 years now since um, the uh, turn to language in the social sciences in the 1980s. And of course, um, uh, this discursive turn, rather, has uh, was pioneered primarily by Jonathan Potter and Margaret Wetherill in 1987 in their um, pioneering book, Discourse and Social Psychology. And since then, there's been uh, a proliferation uh, of work in this tradition, uh, which focuses on situated discourse, including both text and talk. And of course, it introduced a radically different epistemology challenging the sort of mainstream positivist perceptual cognitive models in psychology. Um, my, my friend and colleague Christian Taliga um, says that uh, discursive psychology has represented something of a, a quiet revolution in social psychology, not quite the big bang revolution um, that uh, revolutions are often known for. Uh, and I guess it's fair to agree with him, given the way in which uh, discursive psychology has reworked and reformulated some of social psychology's central topics, uh, topics such as attitudes, attribution, self and identity, social influence, persuasion, um, emotion, and uh, all kinds of other um, topics in psychology. Despite this, however, um, I think it's fair to say that discursive psychology still remains at the margins uh, of the discipline. So what I want to argue today is that discursive psychology's epistemological approach to language as a, as a toolkit of flexible social practices that are uh, deployed for sent everyday sense making and social interaction is an approach that is ideally suited to examining the age of social media and digital communication that we've found ourselves in. Um, understanding the unceasing basil, the babble that we are growing accustomed to uh, in, the, in the age of social media with texts and Twitter and all kinds of fancy technological innovations, uh, most of which I don't use because I find them so, um, so baffling. So we're now in a, in a era where we're absolutely immersed in language. And it's interesting that DP has always championed the study of language in naturalistic settings including everyday conversation, you know, from the banal to, you know, the most formal um, uh, features of talk that we find in a, a range of institutional settings. And indeed, um, uh, discursive psychology has developed systematic methods to study uh, the influence and properties of mediated communication, which is um, one of the most uh, powerful forms um, and as we'll see pers persuasive forms of, of communication that we are witnessing um, today. Now I don't need to um, uh, persuade an audience of specialists in language on how significant language is in human sociality, but I think it's still the case 
that uh, language, and in particular everyday language, has not received the sustained research focus that uh, it warrants in psychology. But before I venture into this, uh, I want to sort of lay out um, some common misconceptions of discursive psychology, um, common criticism that's often levelled at uh, DP, um, one of them being that it's primarily descriptive and not explanatory, that it's about construction and not causation, and therefore, you know, it doesn't really explain, you know, anything of psychological substance. As Jonathan Potter has argued, um, this, of course, privileges cause-effect relations at the expense of the intelligibility of social life. You know, how is social life um, understood and how is that understanding found in the normative basis of human practices and accountability? So DP has been... Um, an empirical and systematic analysis of naturalistic records of human interaction and social action. It's based on careful observation and description. And these are methods that are quite central to the scientific method um, and indeed to um, the naturalistic sciences. We wouldn't have had Darwin's theory of evolution, for example, without his very careful observations and descriptions of the natural world. So having laid my uh, preemptive strike, because I suspect that uh, many of you, um, you know, would, uh, uh, as I said, uh, don't need to be convinced that um, uh, language is, you know, should have the significance uh, or should have more significance in our discipline that it has received thus far. Many of you are likely to think, in fact, most of you are likely to think, well, I'm not sure that DP, you know, or discursive psychology um, actually has the answers. But having laid my preemptive strike um, uh, around that, I want to now look at um, the, the thing that I want to focus, focus on mostly in this presentation, and that is the increasing polarisation that we've seen over social and political issues um, in the last, you know, 10 to 20 years and um, what discursive psychology can do to examine this in its fine detail uh, in its naturalistic settings and uh, examine the nuances of the sort of discursive struggles and competing um, narratives that we see over um, these issues. And indeed, discursive psychology is ideally suited to examining such highly contested debates, how they are constituted and formulated in both everyday talk and also institutional talk. And one of the things, one of the, the um, uh, properties or features of um, these contested issues that has been found time and time again is that speakers no matter what side of the fence they're on, uh, will invariably invoke reason, practicality, and a mix of liberal and egalitarian arguments to justify and legitimate their, their positions. Now, we know this is the case clearly in sort of uh, moderate or what you might call um, moderate uh, political views or centrist political views, but this kind of uh, uh, appeal to reason and rationality is also found quite extensively um, in the talk of extremist views or what many would refer to as extreme right-wing discourse. So uh, both moderates and extremists alike um, are very much um, uh, appealing to uh, people's reason, their rationality, their practicality, their common sense, in order to put their case uh, on the table and to persuade others of their position. Now, this was first identified um, by Margaret Weatherall and Jonathan Potter in their extensive analysis of um, race talk in New Zealand in, in their book, Mapping the Language of Racism in 1992. They found that, that talk around uh, race relations in that country was organized invariably around uh, a set 
of rhetorically uh, so what they called self-sufficient liberal and egalitarian arguments that drew on principles of freedom, fairness, individual rights, equal opportunity. You know, the values that bind social democratic um, uh, nations together, the foundations upon which social democracy, if you like, is built. And they argued that these um, principles functioned like common sense maxims that provided a very basic accountability that didn't really need to be elaborated upon. Uh, they were kind of, you know, clinching arguments that people used um, to close down debate. Um, my colleague Danny or Every and I have referred to these as a toolkit of liberal practical politics. And this toolkit has been found across several studies um, around a number of contentious uh, um, issues, including gender and misogyny, disability rights, and more recently on debates um, on immigration and refugees. So I want to focus on some of this work um, because a lot of my recent work has focused primarily on um, debates around um, the treatment of refugees uh, and policies around asylum seekers, especially in Australia. And indeed, um, you know, this has become a very hot topic in countries uh, all over the world as this has become a highly polit uh, politicised um, issue. The war in Syria, and of course now we see, um, unfortunately, um, you know, history repeating itself with the war in Ukraine. Um, there have been unprecedented number of displaced persons seeking refuge in countries all over the world, um, especially in Europe, and their resettlement um, has polarised uh, very, various uh, communities. It's divided host communities about, you know, what to do. Um, you know, do we welcome um, refugees and asylum seekers? Do we exclude them? You know, how do we manage this uh, uh, this this issue. And of course, um, this has been seen as contributing to the rise of right wing extremism in Europe and in particular also um, Brexit in the UK, um, the polarisation over the treatment of refugees and asylum seekers entering um, um, the UK in particular. Now, what um, a lot of this work is found by discursive researchers who've been at the forefront uh, of uh, analysing um, this kind of uh, work, again, is this appeal to reason and common sense over this particular issue. It's been a, a pervasive feature of political discourse across the political spectrum. So again, not just um, in mainstream political, what we might call liberal, uh, you know, political party views, but also in um, right-wing um, oppositional views. So what I want to do is um, um, look at the way in which um, centrist political discourse uh, first. So in centrist political discourse, um, uh, right, the right-wing are often... Um, uh, derided as irrational, as extreme, and driven by emotion, and not facts. And within centrist political discourse, of course, um, talk is premised on reason and rationality, and indeed the deployment of a lot of um, what's referred to in discursive psychology as factual discourse. And of course, as we know, in the last few years, um, what constitutes facts has also um, become a highly contested issue with the uh, invocation of alternative facts as it was put by um, certain people and indeed people on both sides of the political spectrum or opposite sides of the political spectrum draw on um, alternative facts or their own facts to justify their positions so using facts themselves often doesn't sort of um, close the argument. Um, but when we look at centrist political discourse, talk is premised on reason, rationality. It's more difficult, of course, to challenge when um, that kind of talk is used. And of course, prejudice can be denied strategically by the speaker uh, in this language of moderation and uh, rationality. 
Now, I want to look at the way in which this is achieved in the following slide by Theresa May in a speech that she gave in 2015 to the Conservative Party conference. And this was a speech where uh, she, one of the things that she mentioned, of course, was the influx um, of uh, refugees, Syrian refugees into the UK. And this was um, uh, before, before Brexit. So she says here, and of course, if I was uh, sticking to, um, uh, what's the word, pure discursive psychology, I would have a video clip, an audio clip here of Theresa May in her own words speaking, naturalistic data, but unfortunately, given my technological, um, uh, what is it, technological uh, deficits, I might might call them, uh, I wasn't able to, to put this together for you today, so I've only got the, the transcript. So she says here, while we must fulfil our moral duty to help people in desperate need, we must also have an immigration system that allows us to control who comes to our country. Because when immigration is too high, when the pace of change is too fast, it's impossible to build a cohesive society. It's difficult for schools and hospitals and core infrastructure like housing and transport to cope. And we know for people in low paid jobs, wages are forced down even further while some people are forced out of work altogether. So here we can see May's language um, uh, being measured and restrained. It de indeed, it attends to Britain's moral obligations of assisting those in desperate need with everyday collective categories of belonging, such as we, us, our country. And of course, the, these are uh, typical nationalist tropes, again, found not just in uh, um, centrist parties, um, but also in, in parties of the right. Um, and these are used to justify a contentious immigration uh, policy. And indeed, uh, Goodman and Burke have also found uh, that uh, these sort of non-racial reasons are typically mobilised uh, to support restrictive policies, um, such things as economic arguments, uh, cultural differences, the potential threat of terrorism, and the supposed inability of, you know, some refugees or immigrants to integrate into the host society. And of course, Ruth Wodak and Toon Van Dyke have also written extensively about these non-racial reasons that appeal to the sort of practical problems that um, um, uh, immigrants and refugees pose to um, host nations. So the self-sufficient rhetorical argument, you have to be practical, is ubiquitous in political uh, discourse. While on the one hand, speakers invariably espouse egalitarian principles and ideals, on the other, these principles are undermined by practical considerations. And we can see how this was done in May's um, speech in which a principle is cited, but then, you know, we must help those in need, but then is immediately undercut by the impracticalities that would entail uh, by upholding this principle. So most reasonable people, of course, would say that they're sympathetic to the plight of immigrants and refugees. You know, that is a typical feature of, of reasonable, practical talk. But, of course, this principle is often undermined uh, by practical considerations that make upholding the principle just too problematic. We see this again in um, previous Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull in 2017. Uh, in a speech he um, entitled In Defence of a Free Society, which he gave in Europe. And in this speech, what he does is to um, basically praise the way in which Australia has managed its uh, difficulties with asylum seekers. And, of course, Australia has been dealing with this problem since um, uh, 2001, well before Europe um, has had to, to do uh, with um, um, the management of large numbers of people entering the country. Although having said that, certainly Australia's numbers are nowhere near as large as those that uh, Europe has experienced. 
He says here, as Europe grapples today with unsustainable inflows of migrants and asylum seekers, the Australian experience offers both a cautionary tale and the seeds of a potential solution. The lesson is very clear. Weak borders fragment social cohesion, drain public revenue, raise community concerns about national security, and ultimately undermine the consensus required to sustain high levels of immigration and indeed multiculturalism itself. Ultimately, division. So what is so ironic in this speech, and he, he gave several of these um, while he was in Europe, uh, was a way in which you know, he uses um, the uh, fairly restrictive um, refugee policy in Australia uh, as a way of so-called protecting uh, multiculturalism or multicultural policies that have been the hallmark of the Australian nation, you know, since the 1970s. Indeed, Australia is held up uh, as one of the most successful multicultural nations in the world, something that is often, you know, uh, put on a pedestal and many Australians feel very proud about. Um, and in this way, you see how uh, Turnbull uh, basically suggests that, you know, if we take in too many uh, asylum seekers, too many refugees, then it will threaten this high level of support that the populace has for multiculturalism itself. So like Theresa May in the previous extract, Turnbull equates weak borders with a multitude of threats, including social cohesion and the undermining of multiculturalism itself. Now, as we all know, um, you know, many of you might be thinking, why are you talking about, you know, liberal, conservative um, political discourse? Um, we've been inundated in the last few years with right-wing populism and hate speech. That's where our focus should be. And indeed, um, I, I totally agree. You know, the global rise of right-wing popul populism and hate speech um, is a grave concern um, for, for all of us, and in particular as social psychologists and language researchers. And of course, its accessibility and anonymity has made spreading prejudice an epidemic that is rapidly changing social norms about the open expression of hostile prejudice. And indeed, Katarina Pedersen's work um, in the Nordic North, in countries like Finland and Sweden, um, has found that what was once an unspeakable identity, fascist, has been increasingly reclaimed as a heroic stand against the tyranny of the liberal democratic state, which is, you know, which was would have been inconceivable um, 10, 20 years ago, which shows how much things have changed and how um, um, you know, uh, how, how much we have yet to do to, to deal with this particular problem. So I want to turn my attention a little bit now to the properties um, of hate speech because hate speech is much more than the use of derogatory labels and racial slurs. You know, that's very easy to identify. There's lots of computer algorithms, uh, machine um, applications that can do this uh, very quickly and, you know, the sort of explicit use of, of such hostile language is easy to identify and analyse and, of course, uh, to condemn. But hate speech is typically more exp expansive than this, containing arguments, conspiratorial narratives, of course, and beliefs that justify collective hate. And whilst I don't have time um, to go into this today, of course, a lot of this is justified by so-called alternative facts or conspiratorial narratives which contain so-called, you know, factual discourse. Um, for example, um, population replacement theory as just one example. And, of course, hate speech is conducive to qualitative discursive work that examines the rhetorical and ideological patterns that legitimate the expression of hate. But again, what I want to 
point out today, rather than focusing on, you know, the very clear, explicit racial slurs, which, we, you know, there's no need to repeat, I guess, because it's just so obvious. I want to look at some of the um, similarities that it shares with liberal discourse. Um, as we all know, of course, um, far-right groups in recent years have primarily uh, directed their hostile rhetoric to Muslim minorities in their respective countries and to Islam as a religion or belief system. And, you know, conspiratorial beliefs such as uh, population replacement theory is, is part of this sort of um, uh, constellation of arguments that uh, uh, basically um, white Europeans will eventually uh, be taken over by the sheer number of um, uh, the Muslim population in, you know, what were traditionally uh, white Western cultural um, uh, nations. And Muslim immigrants and refugees have been largely depicted, of course, as holding authoritarian and misogynist values that threaten Western liberal democratic values. So Muslim immigrants are represented as undermining uh, the ethnic and cultural homogeneity of Western liberal nation states. They're seen as threatening uh, our Western, so-called Western cultural values. And in, indeed the term Islamization is often used pejoratively to denote the perceived cultural uh, and ethnic threats that are posed by the presence of Muslim people in the West. And of course, increasingly, um, Muslim refugees and asylum seekers uh, in countries like Syria. And I imagine um, um, a proportion of those perhaps also coming uh, from the Ukraine more recently. But what's interesting about um, uh, this discourse around um, uh, the threats of Islamization is that this kind of discourse is shifting from demonizing people, that is demonizing Muslims as a category, to demonizing belief systems. Even the term Islamization, right, um, is, is a, a, a term that refers to the belief system rather than to the category of people. And we see this in Gert Wilder's um, uh, rhetoric, leader of the Party for Freedom in the, in the Netherlands, where again he had distanced himself from a racist identity or a prejudiced identity by saying, I make a distinction between the ideology, the religion Islam and the people. I have nothing against Muslims. I have nothing against people. I have a problem with the Islamic ideology. It's interesting too that uh, it is referred to, Islam is referred to as an ideology and not a religion. Um, and, you know, we can, we can analyze that to bits, you know, how that functions, I guess, in most uh, free Western cultural uh, nations, freedom of religion is paramount, uh, but uh, uh, the, the way in which it is framed as an ideology rather than a religion does some important um, rhetorical work. And of course, we can see how that language um, of the far right functions to reach out to um, not just extreme factions, um, you know, amongst its potential voters, but also, uh, you know, people who are more moderate, you know, people of the centre. So it's appealing to a wider uh, audience of people who are starting to get anxious and concerned about difference, the presence of difference and potential threats uh, to uh, um, their way of life, if you like. And um, the problem, of course, with uh, many of these far-right um, populist leaders like Gert Wilders is that they are often, um, you know, seen as, as uh, heroes who are standing up for the people and for democratic ideals such as freedom of speech. So even if they are in some way um, sanctioned or, or uh, condemned for some of their language, for some of their views, even if their views 
are moderate, um, they are nonetheless, um, again, kind of uh, reclaimed or redefined as, you know, heroes of um, a particular way of life and also as martyrs, if you like, for upholding um, that precious of, you know, Western liberal uh, value of, of, of freedom of speech, being able to say what's on your mind and um, <clears throat> being able to share it freely. So mainstream um, political discourse and that of the far right also share a strong reliance on nationalist tropes of nationhood, identity and history. However, centrist leaders strategically differentiate and distance themselves from imputations of extremism. And of course, it's convenient for them to do so by contrasting themselves to what they will often refer to as the true face of racism on the right. And this, of course, is integral to their self-presentation as rational, benevolent political actors who are you know, working for the good of the nation. And this is evident in the way in which centrist leaders attend also very judici judiciously to avoiding explicit derogatory and disparaging language, as we saw already Theresa May and um, um, Prime Minister Turnbull were both able to do the same uh, by using, you know, the language of moderation and reason. But as we've seen, the language of uh, uh, moderation and restraint uh, also functions to, often functions, not always, but um, often functions to legitimize, legitimate and rationalise discriminatory and exclusionary policies against minorities as these policies become represented as measures to preserve social cohesion and uh, democracy, safety, multiculturalism, etc. So despite um, the seemingly tolerant nature of mainstream political discourse around issues of racial diversity, immigration and refugees that have dominated the post-war period, I'd like to conclude by expressing concern about the increasing rise of nationalist rhetoric and policies of exclusion during the 21st century. And as I've hoped to have demonstrated, the differences between centrist and far-right discourse on refugees and asylum seekers are sometimes difficult to differentiate and are beginning to resemble each other. Far-right discourse on these issues have begun to spill over into the political mainstream and vice versa as political parties of all persuasion see the electoral gains that may be won by mobilising the language of us and them and by either explicitly or implicitly demonising displaced persons seeking refuge. And of course, you know, we have seen um, moves made to regulate hate speech. Indeed, most Western liberal democracies have enacted legislation the most notable exception being the United States, where, of course, um, um, hate speech is protected under the First Amendment right to free speech in the American Constitution. In contrast, under European Union law, hate speech is illegal and um, concerted efforts, of course, have been implemented to regulate such uh, speech across European signatories. Indeed, in 2016, the European Union Commission pressured Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Microsoft to sign an EU hate speech code and to remove detected instances within 24 hours of notification. And we know um, from uh, a, a lot of work that's been done in this area in the last few years that it is not easy to remove such instances on various platforms. And, um, and in fact, it's not very easy to detect either. Uh, you know, all the algorithms in the world um, will, will detect explicit hate speech, but um, uh, a lot of that sort of uh, coded, covert uh, hate speech that I've been talking about today 
um, you know, algorithms find that very difficult to detect and will go <clears throat> unnoticed. So despite um, this legislation in most Western democracies, curtailing um, free speech itself has become a contested political issue and one that generates heated uh, public debate. Free speech advocates routinely complain about political correctness, it's constraining what people are allowed to say in public, and that this constitutes unacceptable censorship. And of course, Anne Mass has written quite a bit around this, um, this kind of public debate and the dilemmas that we see. Again, you know, the invocation of um, tightly held liberal egalitarian principles or liberal um, uh, principles around freedom of speech and individual rights. Competing democratic values that are invoked in these debates around the rights of minorities to be protected from fear and violence versus individual rights, freedom of expression. So there's much to be concerned about uh, the increasing proliferation of hate speech on digital social me media, narratives of conspiracy and hate can spread easily and quickly to all levels of society, especially everyday um, discussions on online um, chat forums. Uh, and it's notable that the increasing use of these sorts of um, uh, social media platforms has also coincided with increases in the reported incidents of hate crimes throughout the world. So, you know, even though a correlation doesn't prove causation, we can see that um, there has been a marked rise, at least in the reported uh, in reported cases of um, hate crimes and uh, violence against minorities. So what can social psychology do? Or what can we as social psychologists do, I guess? Um, I don't want to be sort of pessimistic and say, well, actually not very much. Um, I think, I think we can do something uh, in, in terms of uh, adding to discussion and debate uh, about uh, how these sorts of issues are played out uh, in everyday life and in the world around us. Um, I think most importantly in terms of our research practices and I guess as academics uh, and not necessarily as political activists, that's what we're here for today. Um, I think the important thing that we need to bear in mind is that multidisciplinarity is more imperative than, than ever before. In order to really get to grips with, you know, I mean, this has been a revolution, digital communication, social media. It has completely changed our lives. And we, I guess some of us could see it coming, um, but clearly... Um, I don't know that many of us could foresee the consequences and the problems that have ensued as a, as a result. I think social psychologists need to collaborate with IT experts, computer science. I know that sounds kind of a bit weird coming from a discursive psychologist, but I think these kinds of collaborations should be encouraged in this changing landscape. Of course, as I've emphasised throughout the talk, there are limits to algorithms for analysing rich qualitative data, but there's no way we can keep up with the enormous amount of naturalistic data that's produced in multimodal formats. You know, it is just unbelievable what's out there. And indeed, discursive researchers, again, to sort of plug um, uh, my colleagues, have been working very hard uh, to find new ways of, of analysing, examining and studying the fine detail of how social media functions, how it operates, how it persuades uh, and what consequences it's having. Not only um, have these researchers aligned themselves with uh, IT experts, computer scientists, but also uh, they've begun to draw on disciplines such as media and communication studies to integrate linguistic, visual and affective, emotional online content, which has become incredibly important 
um, the, you know, the images that are shown on a lot of um, <clears throat> social media um, are often more powerful than the uh, the language that's used itself. And indeed, um, um, I could have written a whole paper, uh, but if, if, you know, please read Katerina Peterson's recent work because she's written beautifully about this. Um, this is another way in which um, uh, people on the extreme right are able to avoid being detected um, as, you know, spreading hate, if you like, because they don't need to say very much. All they need to do is, you know, put up various images uh, which speak for themselves or edit certain villages, crop certain images which convey a certain message uh, and, you know, don't necessarily rely <clears throat> on linguistic content. So fin the final word here, um, and so I'm going to wrap up, I think critically it is essential to move beyond simply analysing the properties of far-right discourse alone and, you know, what most social psychologists have done since the 1980s. You know, we've been blindsided, really, haven't we? We've been so busily studying and researching implicit prejudice and racism, subtle, covert racism. And now there's just this incredible explosion of and reversion to, you know, a 1930s, 1940s world of, you know, explicit um, scientific racism, if you like. Um, you know, how did, how, how, did we, how did we get here? And I think, um, you know, psychology, uh, social psychology in particular, uh, we were warned by various social psychologists, by the way. Um, I'm thinking in particular of um, Colin Leach, who said, you know, in a nice paper that, you know, all this, you know, analysing and talk about implicit and subtle prejudice and racism, hello, you know, um, explicit prejudice is still alive and well. You know, it's all around us. You know, don't be fooled. Um, so, um, again, just to go back to the final point that I want to make, um, I think, and it's it's not an easy kind of project, but I think it's really important to adopt a much more critically reflexive approach to understand the sort of complex intergroup dynamics between both populist and anti-populist rhetoric. And, you know, this self-perpetuating dynamic that reinforces hostilities and political polarisation. We've seen it in debates over COVID and um, immunisation in various countries. You know, um, anti-vaxxers, pro-vax, no-vaxxers. And it's divided families here in Australia and I'm sure in other parts of the world as well, uh, you know, where you know, various family members not speaking to each other uh, because, you know, some of them refuse to get vaccinated or, or the others, you know, have agreed to get vaccinated. And I think, you know, it's important to, instead of, you know, building these ridges and these differences and these, um, uh, you know, very stark kinds of walls between you know, those who are on one side and those on the other. I mean, I know this sort of sounds a bit kind of wishy-washy, but I think perhaps we need to engage in a lot more listening, um, perhaps a, a lot less critique, <laughs> which, you know, I've done a lot of today, of course, of both right-wing and moderate political discourse, but, you know, listening to each other and understanding um, where, you know, each side is coming from. Most importantly, I think understanding fear and anxiety, you know, and how it's embedded in everyday, uh, the everyday lived realities of certain groups of people that perhaps we don't know very much about. And beginning conversations uh, with different others, not in terms of racial minorities, but in people who are minorities in terms of, you know, people who don't agree with us and beginning to sort of bridge those differences uh, by having 
conversations that attend to each other, that listen to each other, that respect each other, and maybe we might get somewhere. So that's that's all I want to say today. Um, ended on a bit of a kind of, you know, Pony up, uh, Pollyanna note, I suppose. But, you know, what else is there? Uh, we can only just continue the conversation and we can only just keep talking because if we don't, then... And um, I look forward to any of the questions that people might have. And thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you.